Welcome to Ed Talks. Uh, my name is David Slump. I'm a Board of Governors Teaching Chair at the University of Lethbridge. And uh, with me today is Dr. Lisa Howard in the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Lethbridge. Uh, she works in, and teaches in the Department of Nursing. So welcome. Thank you for Thank being you, here. What's been your journey from um, you know, into a faculty of, uh, of health sciences and, and into your research um, in the faculty of nursing and, and, uh, and the work that you do here? Well, I, I would say that my journey to the academy has been a bit accidental. Yeah. Uh, I'm a registered nurse and uh, I was a nurse in practice for a number of years before yeah. transitioning into the academy. Yeah. So I worked in a variety of different areas, um, intensive care, cardiac intensive care, um, community care nursing, yeah. and clinical education, so doing staff development, yeah. and then doing some program work, uh, and continuing on with staff development. And in the course of that, David, I met a lot of students as a preceptor myself, because yeah. in nursing we do preceptor students, that's part of our role. I was really excited to have students because as you know, as a teacher, they yeah. really keep you on, on your game. They do, yeah. And uh, that energy was really exciting. I was, uh, as I said, I was doing staff development, so I was teaching clinicians and practices yeah. well, and that's exciting because you're solving wicked problems yeah. in real time. But this idea of working with students just kept coming back to me and really claimed me. Yeah. And I heard there were some exciting things happening in the, at that point, it was the School of Health Sciences. Right. And I thought I wanted to be a part of that. Yeah. Uh, it also coincided with uh, a research journey as well. Uh, because in grad school, I'd done a university teaching certificate, but I was still doing staff development. So that little taste of advanced education was, was pretty exciting and yeah. pretty compelling for me. So it seemed like a really good step. Yeah. And I'd also been doing some research in the area of teaching as well. Um, my research area is motivational interviewing and health coaching, chronic disease management, yeah. and, uh, and I've branched out into um, education for undergraduate nursing right. students as well. And this seemed like a good home yeah. for some of the questions that I had. So I've, that's how I've washed up on this, right. on this shore and ended yeah. up uh, in the academy. So I would say it was a bit accidental yeah. because it was curiosity um, about uh, research and it was also the energy of the students that that really drew me here because yeah. in practice we work with clinicians who are already licensed yeah. and regulated health professionals uh, but coming into the Faculty of Health Sciences now uh, a registered nurse needs to fulfill more than 100 entry to practice competencies in wow. order to be eligible to get the parchment yeah. to exit the university and then be eligible to write the uh, national licensing exam yeah, yeah. So that's a whole other complex level of education. Yeah. And I also had some colleagues that were working in the academy as well. And yeah. so it was all very compelling for me yeah. to come here and join my colleagues um, and see what the, what the bleeding edge of, of nursing education yeah, yeah, yeah. was like. Yeah. You talked about some of the, the big questions that kind of were driving you in your in your journey or in your, your research work, what, what were some of those questions? At the time, uh, there was uh, a big push on evidence-informed practice, and we yeah. were seeing a lot of clinical practice guidelines for the best management of various chronic diseases coming out in practice. Right. And what we were noticing was that patients or clients were being told uh, what the best evidence was to help manage their chronic diseases. And yeah. as clinicians, we were picking up on this, and. Uh, and, and carrying along with that really nobly. Yeah. However, what you might notice, or what you might notice from your own experience, is yeah. that if somebody tells you to do something, if somebody tells you how to eat, or tells you how to take your medicine, you might not necessarily follow through, because your own internal motivations for doing that aren't really yeah. understood. And so I got really curious about, well, how do people do after we meet them yeah. at the chronic disease clinic? What happens when they go home? because there are these awkward moments when they come back or when they're back in hospital because perhaps medications haven't been taken right. as, as was expected. There's these awkward moments yeah. about, so what did you understand about taking your medications yeah. and, that, and that follow through. And so that led to um, a clinical placement at a chronic disease management program where they were introducing a concept called health coaching, which is a motivational interviewing based approach to right. client counseling for yeah. health behavior change. And I did a quality improvement 
uh, project with them. And then I met with my supervisor at the time in graduate school who said, sounds like you've got a research project uh, on your hands. Yeah. And so I continued along with that research question and uh, spoke with clients about yeah. what were their experiences like of having this kind of educational support that wasn't telling. Because mm -hmm. teaching isn't telling. That's it's right. really facilitating yeah. uptake of knowledge and integration into your daily life. Yeah. And clients are with us for a short period of time, whether it's in hospital or an outpatient or primary care clinic. Yeah. They might be with us for an hour or in a hospital for a few days. Yeah. But they're home yeah. a lot longer on their own, solving problems on their own. Yeah. And so how we help them understand what they need to do to find the brightest expression of their health, if we right. can understand their internal motivations, their context, some of their hopes, worries, and fears about health, and we can really tailor our educational messaging. Right. That's where motivation and spirit become really important in helping with the uptake of evidence-informed yeah. practice. So that was really the missing link to evidence-informed practice. It was great for clinicians, but it was just really hard right. to transmit that across to the unique context of our clients. So that was the first research question. Yeah. And then since then, I've, um, I remember reading in the research about motivational interviewing-based health coaching and there's all of these fidelity tests that you do to see how people are actually performing. Yeah. And there was a general consensus that it's a very difficult skill to learn. And I thought, I wonder if undergraduate nursing students can do this. Uh. Because my colleagues had undergraduate nursing students and I'd had them in uh, health promotion programs as part of our community clinical placements. And we were teaching them health coaching. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to all of us that they were doing it. Yeah. And so it was another research question. Right. Well, are they? Yeah. How are they? What is it like for the students to learn this? Yeah. And what is it like for clients that they work with to get that 360 view and including the instructors, of yeah. course, as well? So again, another research question, yeah. another research project and affirming that indeed nurses can learn this skill and it fits really nice with those entry to practice competencies yeah. because when our students exit, uh, there's an expectation that they're going to be able to sit right. down and work with clients, whether that's an individual client, a family, or a community, yeah. on uh, perhaps uh, changing behaviors or um, adopting new behaviors yeah. to find that, as I said, that brightest expression yeah. of health. So that's where that uh, research journey has, has led me yeah. squarely to here, yeah. and it keeps me very much I think like a lot of people in health sciences, located in the problems right. and the challenges of practice. We yeah. always start off with, a, well, why is it like that? And how yeah. can we fine tune this a little bit differently? Yeah. What did you learn uh, about teaching individual clients? So in, in those, through, those you know, through the research that you've done, the, the client that comes and, and, and needs, uh, needs some coaching, what have you learned about how, you know, how to do that well? What I've learned how to, about how to do that yeah. well, David, is to be humble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's very humbling. Yeah. Um, really, because I um, honestly, clients will look at me, yeah. uh, and, or, or patients in hospital will look at me, yeah. and if I'm you know, talking with them about health behaviors, they'll yeah. think, well, you're privileged, and yeah, you look yeah. like you have it all, and yeah. why should I even listen to you? Yeah. And so that's a very humbling experience. And yeah. that's where um, I think motivational interviewing based health coaching is very helpful because you yeah. really come alongside right. of clients. And that's what I've learned. Yeah. I knew that from my early nursing education yeah. because I was a registered nurse when I was very young and caring yeah. for people who were always older than me. So yeah. I did learn how to be humble, but developing the skills to uh, fine tune that style. Yeah. Uh, were really important to me. And so that's what working with clients has really taught me yeah, is yeah. first to be very humble. The second thing is, and uh, we're in a world where evidence is, right. is king, yeah. evidence rules. And I even find that for myself as an educator, I'm always looking, or, and as a researcher, I'm looking at the high quality studies. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering, um, you know, how could I design studies so that they're very rigorous? Right. But in nursing, and I think in other applied disciplines, knowledge is understood as that very rigorous form of evidence yeah. in terms of our hierarchy of evidence. Yeah. But there's also knowledge that comes from your own experience. Right, yeah. And there's also knowledge that clients or patients have. Yeah. And elevating that knowledge and drawing yeah. out that knowledge. And that's, that's what working with clients, patients, families, communities yeah. has really taught me. Yeah. 
is to listen carefully yeah. to that knowledge and bring that knowledge alongside my own experience, my knowledge, skills, experience, and expertise. Yeah. Bring that alongside the best evidence, mm -hmm. and together we'll problem solve something mm -hmm. that really works well for that patient, family, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. community. Yeah, it resonates with my own experience. Of in the sense that when, when you're, yeah, education works in similar ways, and, and I, I always test the research against, does that, does, does that work in the context in which I'm working? Does that make sense? Does it feel right? Does it fit for me, right? And, and that, and, and uh, a lot of the critique that I end up doing of the, uh, you know, educational practices often come from theory that's really disassociated from, uh, mm -hmm. from the realities that you, that you face in your own classroom. How do you teach student nurses oh to develop God. that sense of humility and that sense of I mean, in some ways, there's a contrast here. There's that sense of humility, and then a sense of confidence in what I know and what I bring to this scenario. So, how how, how do you teach them to develop both of those? It's it's capacities? a real yeah, it's a yeah. real balance, David. And nursing education is it's not just education. I, it's a process of formation. Yeah. And we are forming nurses in five broad areas, right. ethical-based practice, knowledge-based practice, self-regulation, service to the public, professional accountability and responsibility. Yeah. And I mention those because professional accountability and responsibility and ethical practice and knowledge, those are those abilities working together to recognize that you have expertise. Right. And yes, you have credibility mm -hmm. because you have a certain form of knowledge. Yeah and inviting a client to share what they know about mm -hmm. that. And so how we teach nursing students is ask before you tell. Mm -hmm. Would you like some more information? Mm -hmm. I've noticed this. Right. And one of the things that I, uh, that I say with nursing students a lot is, um, because as I said, in my own practice, I was, when I entered into nursing, I was working with people who were older than I was. Right. And they would look at me, and I think they even look at our young students, and they say, what is that, you fill in the age, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. going to tell me about yep. you know, my heart failure? Or what is this young person going mm -hmm. to tell us about uh, working with refugees in our community? Yeah. For students, that can be a pretty intimidating thing to hear. And so yeah. the workaround to that, or the way to uh, slide alongside people and still retain a sense of credibility and expertise mm -hmm. is to say, well, other people that I have worked with in this situation right. have yeah. had a similar experience. May I share that yeah. with you? So you can bring your own experience forward. It may be early on in right. your career, yeah. um, but you always, because we have such intense clinical formation for our students, they're gathering practice-based experience to right. augment their theory. Yeah. And so when they do get out into the practice setting, yeah. um, they have that humility, they have yeah. that skill to ask yeah. before telling or yeah. share and give some feedback and then make a request yeah. to provide some further information. Yeah. Not assume that people want to know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where do you see the biggest struggles for your, for your students as they're trying to develop these skills and these kind of ways of being and knowing? The biggest struggle is in just the own feeling of, well, I'm here, I'm getting an education. Yeah. I don't know if you find this yeah. in education. I'm here, I'm getting the education, I must be the expert. Yeah, yeah. And I've got all of this knowledge, I just like to sit somebody down and tell them all yeah. about it. And we'll support them through that process initially yeah. and help them recognize yeah. that that's not really an effective way yeah. of working with patients, families, yeah. or communities. So right. that becomes really clear in their process of formation yeah. that they'll have a client encounter or a family encounter or they'll be working with a community and we'll debrief afterwards. And when I'm asking students how did things, how did things go, they have a sense that they didn't quite click. Right. Uh, it didn't quite resonate yeah. with a client. And then I asked them a lot of questions about, well, how do you think it could yeah. click? What do you think could be done differently? What do you think got in the way? Yeah. And so we just keep asking those questions and eventually they come back to it that, you know, I have expertise. Yeah. And sometimes I just have to learn to hold on to that yeah. and assemble client information and then put that together and make that invitation to yeah. share information. Do you know what I, I have, I'll, I'll sit in the back of a classroom and I'll watch a student teacher and then we often have our debriefing interview afterwards mm -hmm. and I'll 
ask them, how did that go? And, I, and I've noticed over, and I'm wondering if this is similar in nursing, but I've noticed over time sort of a clear pattern. My strongest student teachers are almost always the ones who are able to speak at length about what didn't go well, what could have been improved, how they could be stronger, how they could have done it better. Whereas my weaker ones almost always feel like it went okay, even if it was a terrible lesson that had so many problems. Mm -hmm. You know, ah, it was okay, I think it was pretty good. And you know, they don't have a whole lot to say about it. And then they say, well, what did you think? You know, mm -hmm. Do you notice similar things with your nursing students? We've yeah. noticed some similar things yeah. and it, giving feedback on performance is, is really difficult. Yeah. We do a similar thing where we ask the students to describe uh, in the scope of the best case scenario for how things could have right. gone. Yeah. How did things go yeah. from your perspective? Yeah. So we want the students to have an understanding of what would an expert do yeah. in that situation? Yeah. And how did your performance line up against what your understanding of expert yeah. performance or proficient yeah. performance is yeah. in that particular scenario? And then invite them to think about any ways that they might tweak yeah what they were doing and how could they use the things that they were doing really well because if yeah. somebody is identifying right. oh things went really well yeah. well what are some areas that you could strengthen yeah. and how could you leverage those areas that we're doing that you're doing really well in to yeah. strengthen other areas and then ask them to you know think about what's a timeline yeah. and what are some strategies that you might want to work on mm -hmm. and when can we reconnect and look at this again mm -hmm. so that getting them to think about the big picture mm -hmm. and seeing themselves in that picture because I find that when people as you say in the example mm -hmm. things went really well mm -hmm. something went really well yeah. but in the big picture of everything all of those interlocking pieces of classroom or clinical mm -hmm. performance the student perhaps only could or chose to focus right. on the one aspect that felt really well, that looked well yeah, and yeah. was comfortable. And then again, may I share some information with you about yeah. my observations in the yeah. big picture of things. And rarely do students say, oh, I didn't notice that. Right. It's that they focus on uh, what they felt really comfortable with. Yeah. And that's a good starting point because yeah. they can use that to develop skills in other yeah. areas as yeah. well. So it sounds like you model your practice with clients, with your students. Yes, yeah. we do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's this idea that feedback often, it's the what didn't go well, and people grow the most by learning from what didn't go well. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I find often with these, with these strong students as well, you have to say, well, let's focus on what went well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and there's a lot more room for growth, actually, often when we focus on what went well and how you can, as you said, leverage that mm -hmm. to, um, to really solidify your performance moving, uh, moving forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. Focus on the lesson yeah. and learn from the lesson, yeah. not necessarily dwelling on the behavior. Yeah. How is teaching in the field similar to or different from sort of teaching in the classroom? Teaching in the field, uh, the numbers are a little bit smaller. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if I'm supervising students in preceptorship, uh, I would be providing uh, remote supervision because there would be a mentor that's on site with right. them. If I have students in clinical practice, I would have 12 students out in a community clinical mm -hmm. setting. I would be visiting them at the site, spending time with them at the site. Mm -hmm. And if they move to a different site or if they divide up into a couple of groups, then um, I would be supervising smaller subgroups. Mm -hmm. So the, certainly the groups are very smaller, but the activities now are really increasing because they're right. often out there working on um, projects or they might be um, doing a health fair or they might be seeing clients, they might be doing an immunization clinic. And so there's a lot of moving parts now with supervising students in the field in clinical practice. It seems, I would say you have a little less control, a lot less right. control over yeah, yeah. what's happening out there. Yeah. Remembering that students are prepared before they go out. Right. Uh, they don't go into the clinical field cold. Yeah. And we work out in clinical much the same way that practice does. We have a huddle before we head out, identify yeah. what's the plan for the day, uh, what are some anticipated challenges? What are some things that we've learned that we could leverage to address those kinds of challenges? And what's the signal going to be when we need to call for help? Right. And when can we regroup? When can we reconnect and debrief how things are going on? Because in the field, because they're learning through applying mm -hmm. their theory, 
that debrief and that reflection is going to be really important. And that's mm -hmm. one of the hallmarks that we expect to see in our nursing mm -hmm. students is that self-reflection. Yeah. How do you build capacity for self-reflection? You know, the, the student who doesn't necessarily recognize that maybe that didn't go as well as I had thought, or maybe they, they're too critical of themselves and, and they, it didn't go well at all when it mm -hmm. actually, how do you help them gain perspective in, mm -hmm. in that? It's a very, very difficult skill and there's yeah. many ways that we have students do it. We, have, we start them off with uh, reflecting on the practice of others, mm -hmm. uh, looking at what other people are doing, doing case studies, mm -hmm. for example, so it can be an arm's length experience. Right. So they start to develop that language yeah. and then develop insight to what is self-reflection, what do I need to be thinking mm -hmm. about, and then bringing them into experiences that are quite saturated for them mm -hmm. and asking them how did it go, but not just leaving it open-ended, how did it go. Mm -hmm. We ask them to think about all of these different areas. What kind of knowledge mm -hmm. did you bring forward in that particular situation? What were some of the ethical challenges that you noticed in that situation? Mm -hmm. How did you demonstrate service to the public in that mm -hmm. situation? What did mm -hmm. professional accountability and responsibility right. look like? Yeah. And there's all of those indicators or competencies within yeah. those five broad areas right. the students start to look at and develop an awareness mm. of. So first of all we start by getting them to recognize what are those things in cases and in watching the practice of others and then we start to bring them into experiences where they can notice these mm. things in their own practice and we give them feedback. Because mm -hmm. students I find they don't recognize how they've encountered and resolved an ethical dilemma. Right for example, because yeah, they yeah. always think an ethical dilemma is this absolutely dire situation. They don't realize right. that resolving an ethical dilemma is something as simple as, you know, a client says, I'm not going to take my medication at that particular time because mm -hmm. I want to go and play bingo. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Rather than forcing that on somebody to come alongside them and try and understand, mm -hmm. well, what do they believe about the importance of that medication or that particular um, activity that we'd like them to do? Mm -hmm. When could be another time? So coming alongside of them in relational practice and enacting relational ethics. So it's, mm -hmm. Some of these things are so embedded that yeah. students don't recognize right. them. And as they move through, through the program, they start to see this mm -hmm. more and more. They develop that uh, radar and that sensitivity to all mm -hmm. of those nuances of practice. So, And that's why the clinical experience is so important for our students. It starts right away from when they come into the program and they have clinical experiences every semester. Mm -hmm sounds like you're, you're sort of building a set of heuristics for them that mm -hmm. as they go through the heuristics get get richer and the sets of questions they learn to internalize mm -hmm. and ask is, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is deeper and, mm -hmm. and broader. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You talked earlier about um, part of the nursing program, you're preparing them for their, obviously for their degree, but then there's also an external assessment that in some ways is probably the big, the big motivator for your students most of the way through. Mm -hmm. um, how do you build a program when there's an external assessment that in some ways is, is the, the big thing everybody's working towards? How do you work from that to build a program? Well, the external assessment, uh, the national licensing exam, uh, one of the benefits of that kind of an exam is that if the students have fulfilled the entry to practice competencies, mm -hmm. Um, they're ready, mm -hmm. they need to study of course, mm -hmm. but they're ready and well prepared yeah. um, with the skills, knowledge and experience that they need mm -hmm. to do that exam. Mm -hmm. Of course, I mean nursing education programs in Canada, we have a nursing education program approval board, so our mm -hmm. curricula are reviewed externally. Right. Yeah. Uh, so we have standards that our curricula need that our curriculum needs to meet. Mm -hmm. We are also an accredited nursing program with the now I have to remember, Canadian Association of Schools of Nursing, so right. we're accredited. So there's two external bodies that are looking at the content of our, of our nursing program. Mm -hmm. So when we're developing or doing any changes to our curriculum, we're thinking about how do the activities, the assessments, the course objectives, how do those map to the entry to practice competencies? Right. Yeah. How does that position our students to progress, as you say, through those different levels of heuristics mm -hmm. so that uh, at, you know, at level one, 
they're performing at a certain level. As they move through, we can mm -hmm. pull out those changes and we've got the appropriate assessments, we've got the right experiences mm -hmm. that are positioning them to fulfill those competencies. Right. Because they would not be able to go home uh, and buy the test materials and walk in and write and pass yeah. a national, well, I shouldn't say nobody could, I guess yeah. somebody could. Yeah. You do need for that professional for formation, yeah. but you also need the education process yeah. to prepare yourself to write the national licensing exam. So it's always yeah. on the students' minds, and yeah. it's on our minds as well. Yeah. And in the classroom, students are very aware of it because they're thinking, well, how is this preparing me for mm -hmm. practice? How is this preparing me for the national licensing yeah. exam? And we make those linkages for them right. because the national licensing exam is grouped into different categories. And so in class, when we talk about assessments, yeah. whether it's small group work or an individual product of learning, we do talk, we're transparent about that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that students see those connections. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really important, that they see the continuity, that we're not just invested in getting them out the door and getting them their parchment. Yeah. We're interested in positioning them to be successful. On that, we provide resources for mm -hmm. them to be successful, testing opportunities and mm -hmm. um, exam and mm -hmm. study resources. And we also, prepare them that when you leave the program, that's not the end of your learning. Mm -hmm. You are on a journey of lifelong learning. Right. The first year is gonna be very intense. They get over the exam hurdle and then mm -hmm. they've got the socialization to the practice and then their ongoing professional development. Mm -hmm. So we're really getting them ready for lifelong learning. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My work looks at large scale assessment in the school setting and tends to be quite critical. Um, so it was interesting in the news about a year or two ago when Canadian nursing, um, they switched over from a Canadian exam to an American exam. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. um, what happens, does it happen, and, and if it does, uh, how do you respond as a program when there may be flaws in the assessment or misalignment in the assessment? Do, do you run into that, and, and, and what are ways that 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 gets addressed. I don't have personal knowledge yeah. of it, but I, I'm aware of you know the circumstance that you yeah. talked about when yeah. the national licensing exam was changed. Yeah. And the regulators and the schools of nursing, um, when the students started writing the examination yeah. and there were some questions about its fit yeah. uh, for our Canadian context, yeah. there were some pretty frank discussions yeah. um, between the regulators and the, and the schools of right. nursing. And I think some uh, good discussions. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit of an awkward conversation to be honest, yeah. uh, David, because yeah. I can't re represent sure. the regulator yeah, yeah. on that. Yeah. I guess for me the question comes yeah. to there's programmatic issues in the sense where if an assessment, assessments drive programs mm -hmm. and, you know, and then there's limitations in the assessment, is the danger sometimes having a, an assessment driving program that we might actually miss pieces of what we should be preparing people for. Or oh, that absolutely. Kinds of question. And then how as a program do we respond to those kinds okay. of issues? I see, yeah. I see where you're going with yeah. that. And that's a really good question because um, that is something that people will say, prepare me to pass the exam. Yeah. That exam is for entry to practice. Yeah. That's not an exam for your lifetime of yeah, practice. Yeah. And our yeah. program prepares students for a lifetime of practice, yeah. full scope of practice, in a variety of different settings. Yes, they have the knowledge, skills, and experience right. to write that national, national exam yeah. and gain entry to practice. Uh, but it's also preparing them for more than that. And you're yeah. absolutely correct that yeah. it would be really short-sighted yeah. if we just got them over that threshold of yeah, yeah. writing the exam. Well, then yeah. what? Yeah because nurses work in such diverse areas yeah. that aren't always represented on the national right. licensing exam. Yeah. And the focus of the exam is about safety. Yeah. A lot of the um, questions are very heavily weighted towards right. safety, and yeah. that's a natural concern sure. that uh, the public wants to be assured about yeah, yeah. Uh, for those people that are entering yeah. practice. Yeah. When I hear you describing the program, and it sounds like a very collaborative environment mm -hmm. among instructors, and that, and, uh, how, and, and that's not, I mean, that's not common, I would think, right? A lot of times in academia, we, we each get our own course, it's our own little silo and, and that, and we're not responsible to a broader program necessarily or to each other. And so what's it like to teach in a highly collaborative environment like that? And what are the things that you need to do to thrive in that space? Oh, okay. Teaching in a collaborative environment is a lot like nursing. Oh, yeah. Because, uh, and that's 
that's the nurse's scope of practice yeah. is the ability to work autonomously but also the ability to build good collegial relationships and work effectively in a team-based environment towards mm -hmm. a common goal. Yeah. Uh, so I know that that sounds really idealistic, so how yeah. does it actually work out in practice? One of my colleagues says that uh, as we're developing our courses or revising any of our courses, when you walk into a classroom, uh, you might be the only person, the only instructor in that classroom with the students, but you've got every other instructor who is on your teaching team behind you. Yeah. Uh, so how it works is, uh, the team that I work with is the community health team. I worked with them for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And we look at all of the courses that we're assigned to teach, and then we start looking at how do these map to the entry to practice competencies, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what are our course objectives, what are the appropriate assessments mm -hmm. that we want to provide for our students. And then we start parsing out the work, mm -hmm. deciding, well, who's going to develop this material, um, who wants to, who wants mm -hmm. to test it out, mm -hmm. and who wants to report back to the group on mm -hmm. how things went. Mm -hmm. And so while I may develop um, a couple of weeks or three wor weeks worth of content, mm -hmm. uh, I'll be adapting the remaining content to put my touch on it. But I certainly am not teaching alone in a silo because mm -hmm. there needs to be symmetry yeah. um, between our clinical courses and our theory courses. And I think across our courses too for our students, because if we have you know, 130 students divided into a few sections mm -hmm. taking the same course, students are also good consumers. They want to feel like they're getting something high quality yeah. and that everybody is getting high quality. Yeah. I think that would meet their needs for distributive justice and a right, good yeah. education <laughs> as well. So we do get a bit into each other's pockets mm -hmm. to find out what's going on in our classrooms as we're teaching right. things. Yeah. Now, what about intellectual, or intellectual freedom and mm -hmm. academic freedom? Yes, that's definitely there. You can put yeah. your own flair yeah. on things as well. But if something is really great that we've developed, mm -hmm. we want to share that with other people. Yeah. And we've had it where we've worked on resources in one particular course, and we've tried it out. Mm -hmm. I can think of a particular example where we were doing a unit on uh, related to community health and it was on um, wound care. And we developed a classroom component on it and then the classroom moved into the simulation center mm -hmm. to finish off that particular component. We tested it out for a couple of semesters and we looked at our course objectives again and we sat around the table and we mm -hmm. said it just doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. It would be better with the acute group. Mm -hmm. And so we took those resources and we asked the, the other team if they wanted these and they were mm -hmm. really happy to have them. Mm -hmm. uh, if we develop resources in clinical that are working really well for us, that are fairly general resources to support students, we'll share those across mm -hmm. the program. So Dropbox has a gold <laughs> mine of material in there. Mm -hmm. and. I wouldn't say it's expected, but it mm -hmm. is a courtesy that we do for one another. Uh, if I teach a course by myself mm -hmm. and if I do redevelopment, mm -hmm. um, that I would share those resources mm -hmm. uh, with my colleagues. Yeah. It's because we want each other to succeed. We're used to working in mm -hmm. teams and everybody has an investment yeah. in student success and in our colleagues' success as well. So I wouldn't yeah. want to leave my colleague stranded without course materials right. or course resources. and. And I wouldn't want to shoulder that burden mm -hmm. on my own too. Yeah. How does um, both kind of that collaborative approach to teaching and, and maintaining and building a program, um, and sort of the fact that you're building towards a, an external assessment, um, how does that shape your assessment practices as mm -hmm. an instructor and as a program? It shapes our assessment practices yeah. because obviously they need to first fulfill comp the entry to practice competencies yeah. and then they need to be prepared to write the exam provided yeah. that they can study for it. What we've done is we've adapted some of our assessment strategies. Uh, the national licensing now is uh, exam is all computer based. It's a right. computer adapted exam. Oh yeah. yeah. And so we've introduced these types of questions into our assessments to sensitize right. students right. so that their anxiety levels are lower yeah. when they encounter that kind of testing style right. when, they, um, when they exit the program. Yeah. But it's also been really good for us mm -hmm. to look at different ways yeah. of 
uh, asking questions of yeah. our students. So it's, I think it's really helped us grow in our assessments. We yeah. certainly haven't gone all towards computer adaptive yeah. testing yeah. in our nursing assessments. Yeah. We have students do creative products of learning. We have them do writing. We have them do presentations. There's a variety of different assessments mm -hmm. that we use because mm -hmm. we have to touch on those large mm -hmm. domains and we have to find a variety of ways of having students show mm -hmm. their skill sets mm -hmm. to us. Mm -hmm. But certainly the national licensing exam mm -hmm. and the changes that we've seen and uh, have mm -hmm. helped us grow, I think mm -hmm. they've helped our students grow and yeah, I think yeah. they've helped the practice nice. as well. How about the collaborative side of things? How Do you, do you collaboratively design assessments as a, as a program? Do you have sets of assessments that sort of run in parallel over different parts of the program or, or over the years of the program? What does that look like? Mm -hmm. We have a clinical assessment. We have yeah. a clinical assessment tool that's based on all of these entry to practice competencies and it mm -hmm. follows the student throughout the entire program. Okay. So every clinical session we're pulling out this tool and this is the tool that we use to evaluate their mm -hmm. performance. So we could line up, and students do, they take their, their assessment tools and they line them up from year to year and they yeah. can see their progress. Yeah. Uh, one of the things with an assessment tool is in year one, you might score proficient mm -hmm. in several areas. Mm -hmm. In year two, because uh, the expectations are different with right. the student in year two, yeah. they may not start out at proficient right. in a specific area. So that's the beautiful thing about that tool, yeah. is that it uh, accommodates the student's growth yeah. across the program. Yeah. So that's the clinical assessment tool yeah. that we use, and it's... 15 pages and <laughs> over, oh my gosh, there's so many items on there. Um, but again, it's education and formation. Uh, for our uh, classroom assessments, we do work together on that. And mm -hmm. as I said, we map them to the course objectives. We mm -hmm. make sure that we're addressing our key competencies and we work together mm -hmm. on them. So we may be developing a set of assessments and uh, we'll test, we'll try them out with a group of students. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll look at our student evaluations. Mm -hmm. We'll debrief throughout mm -hmm. the semester to see how students are doing on those assessments. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you find this, that you think you design something and, and you think this is just gonna hit it out on the park. This is, this is gonna unlock learning yeah. for students. And then at midterm, you realize this is not getting yeah students where they need to be yeah. and so we need to regroup or we need to adjust our expectations yeah. you know the syllabus is our contract with the students so we work within the guidelines mm -hmm. of that and then mm -hmm. we uh, we may revise assessments on an ongoing basis yeah. Yeah. I had um, this uh, one of the teams that I work with the community health team I'm on that team is uh, when we had a uh, in the I think it's the January to April session and that's a session where we have fewer sections in community health. Right. And so we were doing a lot of, we do a lot of our tests of change mm -hmm. at that period of time. And I remember myself and a colleague, we had uh, sections running in parallel and mm -hmm. uh, there'd been a pretty significant revision of some of the content over the Christmas holidays. And so we were rolling out with some new stuff in yeah. January. And I would walk down the hall, I would walk out of my classroom, I would walk into my colleague's office and we would talk about how it went. Yeah. And then she had uh, the different section the next day and we would make the revisions yeah. and we would move on. And sometimes, David, I would wake up in the morning based on what had happened with the students, I would yeah. think, how am I gonna help them untangle this piece? Yeah. And the morning before my eight o'clock class, I think, this is what I need to do. Mm -hmm. And so I would quickly assemble these materials and it, 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 it would be good enough and work really well and yeah. so I'd be in my colleague's office saying okay we've got to refine this and yeah. try it out with your group and so we, we would be in this rapid cycle test of change with yeah. these small in-class assessments building students up yeah. to those um, to those bigger assessments yeah. the other um, group that's been really helpful to us in health sciences is the teaching center oh yeah um, and they're very sincere I don't know if I should put this on tape they're very yeah. sincere in their offer to take a look at your syllabus and make sure yeah. that your assessments are helping you meet your course objectives yeah. and that's been absolutely invaluable yeah. to us yeah it sounds like a ton of work and investment in your program 
and, and in the teaching and the program. You know, yeah. David, it's not just us yeah. who are invested in the yeah. program. When we have students out in the clinical setting, yeah. it's our community partners. Right. So it's agencies, it's the hospitals, it's clinics that are hosting students, it's the patients, families, mm -hmm. communities that are all part of that. Mm -hmm. The reception, and I'm sure you find this with uh, teaching mm -hmm. students, mm -hmm. People are really welcoming yeah. of teaching students and people yeah. are really welcoming to our nursing students. Yeah. They yeah. want to help them mm -hmm. learn. So mm -hmm. what it takes to form a nurse, mm -hmm. our curriculum is, is certainly a big part of it. Yeah. Our community yeah. is a huge part of it as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if you have this happen to yeah. you, but I'll have yeah. somebody say to me, and I mean, I mean, I don't um, yeah. take students into acute areas. Right. I'll maybe do have some in preceptorship in yeah. acute or emergency areas, and people will say to me out in the community when they find out that I teach at the university mm -hmm. and I'm in the nursing program, they'll say, mm -hmm. "I had this great student nurse, and their name was," and they talk about this yeah. and about how helpful this was, and I. Yeah. Just, I'm just struck by the impact that this makes on an individual, yeah. but also the investment and trust that they have yeah. in nursing students and in us yeah. as educators yeah. to be collaborators in yeah. nursing education. Because when most people go into hospital with heart failure or surgery, or when most people go into a clinic, they're not thinking, oh, you know, I hope I see a student nurse today. <laughs> It's yeah. something that it is yeah. an encounter that's a bit unexpected. Yeah. And I would say people are overwhelmingly generous yeah. in their investment yeah. in forming our future colleagues. Yeah, yeah we, we see the same, certainly with our student teachers as well. And it strikes me, I mean, it's similar. We have this ethic in the faculty of ed. I mean, the stakes are high, right? Oh, Nobody yes. wants, no one wants a poor teacher, right? I mean, mm -hmm. and, and there's not a luxury in a sense to grow. I mean, obviously you grow in the job, but mm -hmm. there's a certain standard at the beginning that has to be there mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. I mean nursing I mean even more so I would think I mm -hmm. mean there's you know so do you, do you kind of live with sort of the stakes of what you do all the time in your teaching? We, we yeah. do yeah. we do and uh, and and like yourself yeah. uh, you have to answer in your own mind yeah how do I feel about this individual as yeah. my colleague yeah uh, I mean, they, they are our future colleagues. Yeah. And so I need to feel comfortable and I need to feel confident. It's not just a feeling though, it's also supported by assessment tools. Mm -hmm. Assessment tools that um, determine, is this person operating from a place of um, social justice? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, do they have solid moral and ethical comportment? Mm -hmm. Do they have a good knowledge practice? Are they skillful? Are mm -hmm. they safe? Are mm -hmm. they conscientious? So it's not just a feeling that mm -hmm. I, I right. you know, we have a pretty yeah. robust assessment tool yeah. to help us determine where our students are at with that. Yeah. And as a result of that, if there are gaps, mm -hmm. uh, there's areas where we can look at it and we can say, mm -hmm. okay, here's an area where we need to yeah. develop skills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this struck you, but going from being a practitioner to being an educator, you know, I was a practitioner educator and I understood in my own development how complex and difficult it is to be a teacher. And then I got to sit in the back of the classroom and watch students learn how to teach and realized how much more complex it was than I even even understood before that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did, did you go through a similar journey in your own transition from a practitioner to an educator of future practitioners? I did to an extent. Yeah. Um, I'd worked in staff development for a while, so we may have been, right. I'm, I had a role in introducing new policies yeah. and procedures, but again, these were with clinicians in practice that yeah. had a fair um, degree of experience and uh, emotional and physical and mm -hmm. social dexterity mm -hmm. to navigate those kinds of situations. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly with the students you get the blush of that first experience yeah. over and over yeah. and over again. <laughs> Uh, and yeah. it's and it's a reminder, as you say, sitting yeah. in the back of the classroom, or uh, yeah. you know, being yeah. in the immunization clinic, or yeah. talking with the students over the phone as they're, you know, working through some complex clinical situations. Yeah. In watching those situations unfold, I I can't think about well, how would I do that? Yeah. I have to think about. For the student, for where they're at right now, right. and what the expectations are of them in the scope of doing this to the most proficient level for mm -hmm. where they are at, mm -hmm. how are they doing this and how are they meeting those mm -hmm. targets? So it's been a bit about adjusting expectations as well. Mm -hmm. It's also yeah. been, and what I found with the transition from being in practice to being in the academy and teaching um, and being part of that process of formation, 
is articulating the minutiae of detail in my thinking and mm. doing mm -hmm. processes. Mm -hmm. right. Because um, Patricia Benner is this um, nurse theorist and she talks about how nurses move from novice to expert. Mm -hmm. And one of the things as you become an expert nurse, you have now what's called embodied knowledge, mm. where it's um, so deeply embedded in your yeah, practice yeah. that it's invisible, but somebody will watch you and they'll know, yeah. just by physically looking at you, they mm -hmm. will know that's the difference between an expert right. and, um, and a novice yeah. nurse. And so articulating those that level of detail so mm -hmm. that students get a view of what the interior world right. is like of this. And it also creates, and I don't know if this did it for you, mm -hmm. when you go into practice, you have this hypersensitivity now to what you're doing and a yeah. hyper awareness of how you do it and how you think about it, anticipating mm -hmm. that you'll need to make those thought processes clear. Yeah, I had the fun of being able to co-teach a grade six class last year, and I'll tell you, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it brings you right back into, mm -hmm. into all those decisions and things. And, and that you talked about humility earlier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that ability. Yeah. I think we're so privileged in applied disciplines, particularly ones where we have those mm -hmm. clinical pieces, yeah. um, that we can be in the academy, we can be doing research. Yeah. And then for yourself, you can go into a grade six yeah. classroom, or I can you know, sit alongside students who yeah. are in a clinical placement, or even yeah. a graduate student who's yeah. in practice, who's going back and doing an advanced clinical yeah. placement yeah. and it's like I meet my practice new over yeah, yeah. and over and over yeah, absolutely. again. Absolutely, yeah. It's interesting if you, when you talk about your, so your career, you've, you've worked with educating practitioners, you've worked with educating patients and, and you work with educating you know, student nurses. And mm -hmm. What's similar and what's different in terms of educating across each of those three kinds oh, of, okay. kinds of uh, contexts? Well, I think what's similar is uh, level of humility. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, teaching clinicians in practice, there's a level of humility. Mm -hmm. They do, and, and you're their colleague mm -hmm. as well. At the same time, though, they are holding you to a little bit of a, a oh, yeah. different standard. Absolutely. I felt like they really held my feet, mm -hmm. feet to the fire. Yeah. Because not only did I have to take these really complex things, but uh, I had to demonstrate a high degree of clinical proficiency, yeah. even though I was the educator, I had yeah. to demonstrate that proficiency yeah. as if I were actually doing it yeah. regularly in, in practice. Yeah. It's interesting because that credibility is really, really important. Yeah. And I would say, so humility is consistent, um, credibility is really consistent, but yeah. it looks different. Right. Credibility for clinicians in practice looks different than credibility for students. The degree mm -hmm. of clinical expertise that they're looking for is a bit different. Mm -hmm. And I would say one of the things that's, um, that changes between those groups is language. Right. So when talking with clients, I have to be able, or families, or even mm -hmm. speaking with communities, I would say the knowledge translation piece, the language is really different. Mm -hmm. So imagine for yourself, if you were explaining um, some of your assessment research mm -hmm. that you do to a parent-teacher group yeah. or to a parent group, yeah. your language is going to be really different. Yeah. And how you handle credibility is going to be different because yeah. they might, some people are a little suspicious of yeah. people in the academy. I don't yeah. know if you've run into that, but I've Absolutely. run into that in healthcare. <laughs> yeah. They're just a little bit suspicious of yeah. people in the academy. And so to allay some of those suspicions, mm -hmm. um, establish some credibility, mm -hmm. come alongside them and identify what's in it for them yeah. and use language that's meaningful. Mm -hmm. uh, so really tailoring messages to the different groups. So I would mm -hmm. say language yeah. is, is the thing that really changes. And of course with clients, we have to think not only about health literacy, mm -hmm. but their basic literacy skills. Mm -hmm. We have mm -hmm. really diverse populations yeah. that we work with and uh, I did a project with some students as part of a clinical placement and the population that we were working with didn't speak English. Mm -hmm. uh, so students, we were sitting in English as a second language oh, wow. classes yeah. trying to determine ways that we could support this community yeah. to navigate a doctor's appointment mm -hmm. and they don't have any literacy mm -hmm. in English, yeah. or it's very, I would say it was very basic yeah. literacy. Yeah. So we really had to change our message and change our language yeah. to accommodate those different populations. Complexity in, in terms of context is sort of a theme that seems to have come up quite often as you were talking. In mm -hmm. that. And, and mm -hmm. um, I suspect that's what breeds humility as well as, as grappling with those two 
those two things. But how, how, do you, how do you work with student nurses to sort of get a sense of individual patients in the context? Not that they necessarily find themselves in when they're in the hospital, but the context from which they've come that are going to shape whatever mm -hmm. they're able to do or not do in, in respect to the advice or, mm -hmm. um, you know, the coaching that, that, um, that they're receiving. That's a question that really speaks to my heart, David, yeah. and it's one of the reasons why I got into nursing because I'm yeah. intensely curious about people. Yeah. I don't think we're all the same. Yeah. And everybody has a story. Yeah. Every, everybody, person, every family, every community has mm -hmm. a story. And so, and that lends to their complexity. Mm -hmm. it, it can be really tempting to reduce individuals to perhaps their disease pathology mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or the crisis that they're facing mm -hmm. as a community. Um, but really sensitizing nurses to that, I think is, uh, I think at the mm -hmm. heart for me of, of nursing. And yeah. in the early parts of their program, they spend a lot of time developing those relational skills. Mm -hmm. And then we build on that over time. Mm -hmm. It's very stressful though, if you can imagine. Um, imagine, oh. for example, that I wanted to uh, teach you how to do an immunization, yeah. for example. And while you're doing the immunization and while you're maintaining all of the essential skill-based mm -hmm. features of that, I'd also like you to interview the family at the same time oh, yeah. <laughs> and ask them about their day, um, what is their understanding of this, mm -hmm. um, how would they deal with a variety of different situations that might come out of it. Mm -hmm. So there's these tactile features that they need to navigate yeah. and then there are these higher level cognitive features where they have to take uh, general knowledge yeah, yeah. in the exam, in this case about immunization, yeah. understand the family's context yeah. and tailor it to them yeah, yeah. and then if you're in an immunization clinic in Lethbridge if mm -hmm. depending on the time there could be you know somebody fainting and there could yeah, be yeah. children running around and there could be mm -hmm. you know a huge family <laughs> sur surrounding the yeah. students staring at them and yeah. hanging on every word yeah. uh, so they develop those skills over time yeah. and then they're also accompanied in clinical so that if it seems like the complexity is getting a little bit high mm -hmm. um, and, and I think of like an immunization mm -hmm. clinic, there's just a lot going on in that kind of a setting. Mm -hmm. We can come alongside the student, either the clinical instructor or one of the mentors, one of the nurse mentors there, mm -hmm. and can start to help the student along, mm -hmm. uh, either by conversing with the family or supporting the skill that's going on or helping mm -hmm. out with some part of the assessment. Yeah. You talked earlier, you mentioned the term best practice, mm -hmm. and that is, that's one of the things that you were looking at when you started and with your early questions. And mm -hmm. As you work with context and complexity, does it, does it problematize the notion for you that there are best practices? And, and, and how do you deal with that in a, in a nursing education program? It's a big complex question. Yeah. Uh, for myself, as a clinician in practice, yeah. as an educator, as a researcher, um, there's evidence-based practice, yeah. and there's practice-based evidence. Yeah. We don't privilege one right. over the other. Yeah. We have to look at them and understand in this context, how do we bring yeah. these two together? Yeah. Because uh, yes, best practice might be a certain set of um, criteria or a certain set of mm -hmm. things that we would expect a client, a family, or, or a population to do. Mm -hmm. But if there are issues of poverty, mm -hmm. if there's lack of education, if there is, um, you know, perhaps there's crisis in the community, these things that we, the social determinants of health mm -hmm. um, influence how people experience yeah. their health. There's best practice and then there's best preference. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. clients have a best preference. Yeah. A family would have a best preference of how they'd like to do things. Mm -hmm. um, I think even as, as a program, you know, we know what the best practice is and we have preference mm -hmm. around what we would want right. to do. Yeah. We aspire towards best practice. Mm -hmm. We understand in some contexts mm -hmm. we have to uh, negotiate what that looks like. Mm -hmm. So I would say we're uncompromising in yeah. our standards, right. but we're also compassionate in recognizing that people can only do what they mm -hmm. have capacity to do. Mm -hmm. And so best practice isn't a hard thing, right. um, it's a moving target. Right. 
All yeah. right. and, and I think if you can be comfortable with that as yeah. a clinician and you can say, what is the best practice in this situation, mm -hmm. given the context, knowledge, skills, and experience and history mm -hmm. of what's going on yeah. here. Do you find, I, I find in, in the Faculty of Education, we have students, they just want, tell me, tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. Right. So give me the give me the give me the plan that's going to make me knock this out of the park every time. Right. So they want that sense of best practice, in sort of a hard mm -hmm. in a hard you know a hard clearly defined very rigid kind of way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's for that reason actually I, I rarely talk about best practice. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about best practice for that or good practice for this scenario or for mm -hmm. that situation. Mm -hmm. or, um, do you find do you find that you have students who kind of bump up against that this idea that I have to understand what the standard is, but it's not fixed. It's it's fluid based on context. And, mm -hmm. and, and how do you mm -hmm. help students work through that? Well, that is difficult, isn't yeah. it? Because it's it a level of complexity. Yeah. And I think at um, you know at at a certain level in the program, uh, students want that. They want that hook to hang something on that's very concrete yeah. to them. That's very predictable. That's very tangible. It's very stable. Yeah and they like that. The reality of the world is, is that that doesn't yeah. work. And so we'll um, scale them up from that point and we'll show them some predictable situations where sure, you can achieve yeah. this kind of best practice. Yeah. But ultimately, there, we have to present them with different um, and more challenging scenarios that help them make decisions about what is best practice in this situation and how do I maintain safety? Mm -hmm. How do I maintain patient comfort? Mm -hmm. How do I maintain efficiency mm -hmm. to get the good outcome? Mm -hmm. Because it's not, uh, it's not a cookie cutter approach here. If it was that yeah. simple, we could um, churn people out in two yeah. years and it would be you know, a very simple program. But if um, there's best practice for, for example, um, diabetes care. There's mm -hmm. best practice for congestive heart failure. Yeah. There's best practice for the management of hypertension. Yeah. Well, what about if somebody has hypertension and diabetes and blood pressure? And some uh -huh. of these best practices actually contradict one right. another yeah. when we start to put them all together. Yeah. And so as we move the student along and we can present them with an example of that, mm -hmm. then they get it. Yeah. And then they understand that this is their octane. This is where they right. um, excel in their practice and demonstrate the value yeah, of yeah. registered nurse practice mm -hmm. in understanding that complexity and the ability to take these separate but competing imperatives from mm -hmm. two different sets of best practices mm -hmm. and understand what's going to be the best practice for this particular context. Mm -hmm. And so I think your caveat of best practice for this scenario mm -hmm. is really important and very relevant mm -hmm. and resonates mm -hmm. for us in nursing. Yeah. We often talk in education about sort of the, the art and the science of education. Mm -hmm. Do you talk about the art and science of nursing? Is there is there that sense of, um, of both of those qualities being part of what makes a good nurse practitioner? I think in education yeah. it, you would say it's not art in terms of it's very artistic. No. It's yeah. um, it's something that's very creative, but it's also you know moral. It's also yeah. ethical. There's right. values. There's beliefs, and so there's it's not solely based in in science. Yeah. And so we do talk about that. I mean, nurse theorists write yeah. about that yeah. as well. About these are fundamental patterns of knowing yeah. that we have, that we and that we cultivate yeah. uh, in the process of forming student nurses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we get them to reflect on that as well and yeah. tease out what part of this is empirical practice, what part of this is aesthetic right. practice. Yeah. And how do they manage that? Is that Well, it's a difficult one yeah. because empirics are always easy to understand, <laughs> aren't they? But then it's presenting them with cases of increasing complexity and the clinical, so we do cases, of mm -hmm. course, in, right. in classroom settings, and we'll do simulations mm -hmm. in our simulation health center. We'll present them with increasing levels of complexity. Right. And ultimately, when they meet this in the fleshy bodies of yeah, our yeah. clients, families, yeah. and communities, then they really, really get it. Yeah. And we model that for them. We don't just throw them in and say, okay, here's your theory, go for it. Yeah. We're going to show them what the best practice for that situation looks like, yeah. um, and then debrief that with them, mm -hmm. and then ask for their insights. 
how did that nurse demonstrate you know empiric knowledge how did I demonstrate aesthetic knowledge mm -hmm. how did I show that and how did I put those knowledges together that the client brings to the situation mm -hmm. with my expert clinical knowledge yeah. and when they start to see that and recognize it in others then they can begin to cultivate a self-awareness yeah. of that in themselves yeah yeah fabulous mm -hmm. yeah I think that gets us to the end of uh, end of our hour. So thank you very much for taking your time to share your expertise and uh, your experience with us. So, thank you. Well, thank you so much, yeah. David. It's been good to be with you today. Yeah.